welcome everyone to this uh, parallel session two. Um, we would all like to be in Ljubljana, Slovenia at the moment at the pre-presidency conference of uh, TEPSA and of the Center of International Relations, but we're not, we're digitally connected, uh, but that's okay for the moment, but I hope to see you all soon in person. In this session, we will be discussing European solidarity. And I think there's no better time to discuss European solidarity, in fact, because in times of crisis and in times of a pandemia, which we've never seen in this dimension before, European solidarity is needed more than, more than ever. And there's also more demand for European solidarity. Now, um, we will be discussing European solidarity in action and the future of Europe. This is the title of the session, and uh, we will be discussing uh, this theme, this topic, with a very prominent and very kind and knowledgeable uh, set of panelists, and, and which I'm going to introduce to you. We will be uh, listening and discussing with Maya Buja. Of course, you know Maya. Welcome, Maya. Uh, to your conference. <laughs> uh, Maya is uh, from the Center of International Relations, uh, University of Ljubljana, and of course, a uh, well-known TEPSA member. Let me also welcome Katrin Bertka. Uh, she's uh, connected to us from Berlin. Uh, Katrin uh, is from the Institute for European Politics, the Institute for Europäische uh, Politik, and of course, a very known TEPSA member to all of us. Let me also welcome from Portugal, Alice Cunha uh, from the Portuguese Institute of International Relations. Uh, we all know Alice, thank you for being with us. Thank you for making this happen. Uh, welcome uh, to, to you. And uh, last but not least, let me also uh, very warmly welcome Risto Panchugov from Bulgaria, from the new Bulgarian University, also, of course, a TEPSA member. Now, my name is uh, Paul Schmidt from the Austrian Society for European Politics, and I have the pleasure to chair this, this very interesting uh, round of discussions. And um, let me also say that all of the panelists are actually authors in our upcoming book on European solidarity in the future of Europe, Views from the Capital. Um, you know that in our TAPSA um, book series, a yearly, a yearly exercise, uh, we have chosen the topic for this year for European solidarity. And uh, the book is actually finished. It is with the publishing house at the moment. It will be published um, this uh, late summer. And we will, have, we will all organize outreach uh, and discussion activities once it is published. Uh, but let me let me say that um, all the uh, discussants can can also uh, refer to uh, their articles in the book and uh, see how they can actually relate to the current situation of pandemic of the pandemia. How is European solidarity viewed from their country's point of view through the national lenses? Um, what are the implications? Um, what are the implications for European affairs uh, regarding the different concepts and the different uh, expectations on solidarity? How has this changed in times of pandemia? Um, what are the priorities there? How has public opinion changed? There are many differences between the countries. What are the lessons learned for European solidarity and the expectations for European solidarity? So there's a lot to talk about. And we will start with um, inputs in alphabetical order uh, from the different um, analysts. And then we will move to a Q&A period um, and have enough time for discussions, for your questions, for your comments, um, because uh, this is all about exchange of opinions. Uh, with with this, I would like uh, to to stop here as chair and and maybe hand over to Maya and ask Maya to um, kick off the session by giving her views on the state of play of European solidarity and on how Slovenia and the different um, the different elements of society in Slovenia actually view European solidarity at the moment. What is European solidarity? Where should it go? Um, what is, what is the difference between um, reality and actually 
the the expectations which we have i think that's that's also a, an, an interesting question my the flow the, the zoom is yours uh, let, let, let's let's get it started thank you thank you very much paul uh what i want to present uh, to you is a chapter that we contributed to the book that paul was mentioning and the chapter was prepared during last summer so uh, the few remarks that I will be making will be outside the chapter because as Paul asked, we also want to hear what are the views afterwards, particularly with the COVID being prolonged. Uh, the chapter only covers the first wave, so to say. Uh, maybe I should start off with one of the I, appearances of how solidarity is being perceived at least in discussions that we had uh, among the Slovenian uh, partners. Uh, I should not forget also to mention that I'm not the sole author of the chapter. Bostjan Udovic, who's also taking part at uh, this session, has contributed substantially to the text as well. So one of the things that we noticed is how um, solidarity is really uh, seen as only a one-way street in a way. We expect that others have uh, feelings of solidarity with us. So we expect that other countries, other members of EU will express some solidarity with Slovenia when Slovenia has issues on the table. Whereas going the other way around that there should be also some solidarity of Slovenia with the problems which others are facing, uh, that is not so often being tackled. Uh, so one of the clear examples of this is we expected solidarity from the EU member states uh, in the time of COVID, and we were very critical of some of the member countries who did not show enough uh, feelings of solidarity. But on the other hand, when you raise the question of migration uh, and the question of, you know, uh, resettlement of migrants to, to, to our own environment, this was something where the Solo Slovene solidarity was really not in the forefront, just the opposite. Many local communities in particular were very much concerned with this issue. You know, why would these people want to come here and how they will disturb our way of life? So there was no idea of solidarity seen there. I think part of the reason for this attitude um, is has to do with the way the solidarity issues are being portrayed to the media. I'm afraid that particularly in the last years when, you, when the reporting on EU is being done, it is really very much um, negative. It's, it's the negative news which get more attention, meaning where are the problems, where are the difficulties, who has done something which is not in favor of Slovenia, who has not supported us in our arbitration negotiations with Croatia about the borders, uh, who has not allowed us to get the equipment and medical equipment necessary for the COVID, to fight COVID, et cetera. This was in the forefront of the news. On the other hand, there were some very positive examples where Slovenia benefited from the EU solidarity which were really difficult to find. I mean, we knew that there was a, a substantial help coming forward from the EU at the time of um, a natural disaster Slovenia experienced with the sleet. This, uh, all the trees uh, were frozen or covered with ice. And we received a substantial support from the EU, including also some individual member states, and yet, uh, you know, if you try to locate information on that or what was done with these resources, it is practically impossible. So again, you know, you see this approach to promoting one kind of solidarity and not showing that, uh, you know, there are also times uh, where um, the EU solidarity really played an important role in dealing with our, uh, with our problems. Uh, right now, I would say that the feeling is that when it comes to the issue of solidarity, uh, there is solidarity among some of the new member states or the neighboring uh, member states, but not sort of the overall. So we expect some solidarity or we also witnessed some solidarity in the case of Hungary, for example, which has recently uh, loaned us a whole load of uh, COVID uh, vaccines. Um, 
there was some solidarity from Czech Republic in this case, etc. So you know, this is more, I would say, the same um, same type of countries, if I may use this word, uh, but not a broader EU level solidarity sort of experience. And I think you know the COVID had a negative impact on the feeling of solidarity in EU. Uh, some of the activities, some of the actions of the member states uh, sort of were more in line of we come first, individual country comes first. And even in the media, these, this was much more stressed than on the other hand, examples where the solidarity was present. Uh, for example, you could not find in Slovenian media report on the fact that Germany offered hospital beds to the French COVID patients when France was in, in deep problems. So I think in a lot of, a, a lot of issue of or the way uh, to portray solidarity in a better, in a more proactive way, uh, in fact, depends also on how the government is reacting towards the EU policies. And um, in this respect, I see a negative change in Slovenia. Uh, we are becoming much more Euroskeptic, even though, you know, if you would ask me two years ago when we were talking about Euroskepticism you know, with Paul and some of the other mem members of TEPSA, I was saying that Slovenia is very much supportive of EU. And in general public, there is a, still, you know, the last figure which was put in this. Uh, chapter was 62% of the Slovenian population was very supportive of the EU, even though this has been a drop from the day when we were uh, admitted as a new member country, when we entered the European Union, the support was over 90%. Now we had a 62%. And I think, I think part of the problem is that uh, the attitude uh, or the communication coming out from the government has not been proactive in a sense that the things where there was a very positive contribution from the EU to the Slovenian, I would say everyday life through the cohesion funds, for example, was really not attributed sufficiently to the EU policies. You know, when there was a new road being opened up, it was the local mayor who uh, cut the, the tape and said, you know, this is what we have achieved. And very seldom it was mentioned that this has actually been achieved through the cohesion funds. Uh, and we could not do so much in terms of infrastructure, so much in terms of many other projects, unless we would be member country. Uh, similar, um, I would say not exploited sufficiently um, example of European solidarity is the whole framework for recovery and resilience. Because Slovenia has prepared this, pro this framework practically in a complete closure, so to say. It was not publicly open debate about where should we put these funds which are now available to us. Uh, it was a nearly secretive meeting of a group of uh, government officials who prepared this program and it was released publicly on the same day as it was submitted to the commission. So again, to my view, unexploited opportunity to promote EU and promote in fact EU solidarity because this is an amount of money which is very important for Slovenian development that we are able to reach out for, and yet we have not shown it in this way to the Slovenian public. So let me conclude by saying that I think one needs to do a lot more in promotion of the concept of solidarity, and then we would also be able to extend the solidarity out in the open uh, when it's not only our need, but our opportunity to support somebody else. In the member country, in in the union, or in the individual member countries. No, well, passing on the word to you. Thank you very much, Maya, for your for your interesting first input. Uh, if anyone wants to comment or or ask a question, please please feel free to use uh, the chat function and and send us 
your question or comment, uh, and then we will bring it into the discussion. I already have a lot of questions myself. Um, just one quick follow-up question before we move on to Katrin. Uh, Maya, um, well, regarding the National uh, Recovery and Resilience Program, I mean, we had the same story here in Austria, of course. It was not uh, publicly discussed, but we still hope that uh, once um, the green light is given uh, and once uh, Ursula von der Leyen these days comes over to, uh, to give her uh, official consent, um, uh, we can actually um, discuss uh, the, the different projects because someone has to implement them anyway. Um, now, uh, you've mentioned the political developments in, in Slovenia, of course, and, and uh, I, <laughs> I wonder which question I should choose. Um, um, you have also said that solidarity is something which is expected, but not something that... Uh, Slovenia that is easily given by Slovenia to others. Are there, are there some areas where you would say that Slovenia shows solidar solidarity with others and which areas are they? That would be one question. And uh, how is the joint procurement uh, for um, uh, vaccines seen in, in Slovenia? Let me start with the second one. The joint procurement is seen as positive because we feel that being a small country, we would not have the same bargaining position as we have it through the EU. That's one part. And the other part again is that we are not quite satisfied with the amount of vaccines coming to Slovenia. And uh, there was a question in chat that uh, Hungary loaned us the vaccines. Yes, but it was AstraZeneca, which some cynically commented, yes, you are giving us the vaccine nobody wants to take in, in Hungary. So, but, you know, okay. Well, they're not, they're not giving you Sputnik, Maya. No, well, at least not that. <laughs> but anyway, yeah, well, you know, in general, I think people were, were appreciative of, of this gesture. Uh, Slovenian solidarity, I think, is particularly something that you could see in the issue of um, any kind of elementary disasters. I think we have a very good first response uh, in that area. So, you know, either fires or earthquakes or whatnot, this, this has, Slovenia has always been among the first countries to react. It also contributes to this European uh, initiative on first response. So this def they're definitely we are part of that. Uh, I'd, I'd say probably the most difficult one was really the migration issue because this has been something which is uh, on the agenda of the right wing parties as you know, this is a no go for Slovenia. We are too small to accept anybody here and it's going to upset us too much. So in, in that field, I think we cannot really brag about much solidarity. Small but beautiful, a little bit like Austria. Katrin, <laughs> <laughs> uh, over to you, to the bigger neighbor. Yeah, yeah. big but question mark. <laughs> no, 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 we love you very much. So what's the German approach to solidarity and has it changed? Yes, thank you very much. First of all, I would also like to thank the organizers for the invitation and uh, also want to mention that um, I am one of the three authors of the German chapter in the book, but Funda Tekin, who's also present and whom you've seen earlier speak already, um, and Frederica Augustin are the two other authors as well. So I'm, I'm, I'm speaking on my own, but also on their behalf, so to say. And I think it's very interesting that Germany follows um, Slovenia in this regard, because we have many commonalities, especially regarding the, uh, the critical view uh, of uh, European endeavors but also very many differences. And uh, I think I will, you will see which ones I mean uh, in a minute or two. Um, first of all, I would like to um, just briefly kind of contextualize the term solidarity from a German perspective. Um, and then I will move on to the European level because um, the term is very present in the political discourse in Germany also before um, COVID, because we have the so-called solidarity tax, which is a legacy from the German reunification uh, and which has reminded German citizens over the last 30 years that every taxpayer contributes to social cohesion of the country. So the question of um, how much solidarity do we grant each other and how much cohesion do we want to achieve is a discussion that we have both on the national and on the European level, uh, which probably is also due to the size and the um, heterogeneity of the country, let's say. Um, 
And uh, this discussion was in a way continued um, during the refugee movement in 2015 and the discussion that we had in Germany uh, on taking in the refugees um, and Angela Merkel's motto of Wir schaffen das, which um, created strong dividing tendencies in the German society. So on the one hand, we had those who promoted solidarity and uh, called for a so-called Willkommenskultur and the other group uh, developed uh, what we call an Ablehnungskultur, so a defense mechanism against uh, being solidary with the refugees. Um, for Germany, I would say that obeying laws and social distancing as acts of solidarity are of course a novelty for us. Um, uh, usually we have a more empowered civil society and they are very critical about accepting rules and regulations uh, from the government where they cannot uh, have a say and where there's not a, a careful deliberation process uh, going on beforehand. And that was not possible when the first lockdown was decided. But it was widely accepted in the German public um, and um, also supported. Of course, um, through the course of the year, there was also the pandemic fatigue noticeable in the German society, but the, the groups that were not supporting the anti-corona restrictions were quite um, loud, but not very um, in the majority, let's say. Um, one other element I think that's important from the national level is that um, the German government already in March of last year adopted the largest assistance package in the history for the recovery from the, from the pandemic, which included the purchase of protective equipment, the development of a vaccine, um, and a tax reduction and a short-term working allowance for business, which um, led also to the fact that uh, the German economy has declined less than others uh, in average. Um, and this is strongly connected also to the European level. Um, so the, the fact that we had strong economic um, strong economic uh, support and uh, subsistence measures in Germany also uh, strongly connects to the European level because, and this is where we see the strong difference between um, Slovenia and Germany. I think the discussion in Germany was more how much solidarity do we want to grant rather than how much solidarity can we get. So the discussion was more about do we want to have uh, uh, an instrument um, that also covers economic support um, to other countries. In the very first period of the, um, of the crisis, there were also national crisis management instruments, including export restrictions on medical equipment and also uh, measures of closing borders. But this was only in the very first kind of weeks of the pandemic. Later on, um, as Maya also mentioned, um, the focus was more on the support. Some damage was already done because it was, of course, the impact or the view that, uh, the, that the measures were more egoistic rather than um, solidary. But still, I think it's important to, to keep that in mind. And um, another element that Germany supports, and I think also the, it, it, that is not seen as that negatively, let's say, in the, in this, uh, in the public, is um, the, the European vaccine strategy. I think the discussion was not so much focused on this in Germany also because um, there, were more, more, there was more criticism on the national and on the regional um, way that the distribution of the vaccines was handled. So um, I think the EU level was not so much the, the center of attention in this case. There was a lot of criticism on how it was handled on the national level. And then also because of the federal structure, there were different measures and different speeds also in the different lender. Um, so, so this was less an issue in Germany. But coming back to the financial solidarity, um, the um, economic support um, that was decided in form of the next generation EU program, I think it's important that this was um, after some time, let's say, uh, again, a success story of the Franco-German tandem that there was some agreement that could be reached between these two countries uh, for this support program. And um, it is also, um, I think, always being discussed in Germany as kind of a change in the whole rhetoric and the whole strategy of the German government towards um, distributing funds uh, among member states. So I think this part of the discussion is much more present in, in the German debate than uh, what do we use the funds for in the future? Then do we want to have this kind of distribution on the European level? 
Um, and um, I think uh, when we look at, at um, the more recent uh, developments, I think the German debate is very much, of course, formed by the um, upcoming parliamentary elections and the questions who will become the next chancellor of Germany. Um, and so the discussion is often quite heated, especially if you look at social media or um, also in the press. Uh, but And there's always a kind of a no negotiation going on who has to be solidary with whom. But it's mostly about young versus old, people that have jobs where they can work remotely or not, and less um, the question on whether or not we want to have solidarity on the European level. I think this is something that is more or less taken as a given. I think I will leave it at that for now, but I'm happy to answer any follow-up questions. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Katrin. Um, it's very true that uh, also from, it is also our observation, our perception that, 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 that Germany is actually showing uh, solidarity, granting solidarity. But of course, solidarity is probably uh, not only an act of selflessness, uh, because I mean, the German economy can, can only prosper if other prospers too, because we are all interconnected. And, and this is all related, of course, uh, to the uh, working of, of, of the single market. Uh, but nevertheless, it could be, could be the other way around. So we're glad that there's actually, um, and you've mentioned it, uh, the issue, for example, of the next generation EU, the, uh, the, the German uh, Franco tandem uh, in, and, and their approach there. Um, and, and also, I mean, Germany has the size to have done, of course, the uh, vaccination procurement, the vaccine procurement themselves, which, which, which others don't. But in the end, it doesn't help Germany if, if Germany is all vaccinated and, and the others are not. And, and I think this, this is an important issue. But uh, what uh, Roderick, for example, just put into the jet, I think is a very, very important issue too, uh, which is the question, what about this intergenerational um, solidarity? Uh, the, the, this is something which we also have in the European treaties, but this is, of course, also a, a very uh, pertinent issue on, on a national level. And also um, interesting to see that the European Union has exported millions of vaccines, um, which is... Uh, not very common in, in international affairs these days. We know that the UK hasn't and, and the US haven't uh, exported any vaccines. Uh, their approach was uh, UK first or US first, while uh, the European Union had a different approach there. But at the same time, not having been able to offer vaccines to a, a, a big majority of their population, um, in particular, the, the younger generation, the younger generation, which had to stay at home um, to show their solidarity, their international intergenerational solidarity, which are now waiting to um, get back their, their, their life chances and to be vaccinated themselves and to be able to move. And, and how do you see these, um, these, these frictions, these inter, intergeneral, intergenerational frictions, and how do you see actually the issue of export of, of, of vaccines? Is this something which is seen by the wider public? Is this something which is perceived, which, which there's actually knowledge about? Is this seen positively, negatively? Is there a public opinion on this? And, and uh, do you think that uh, um, the young is showing uh, overproportional amounts of solidarity? Yes, thank you very much. Um, and maybe just uh, that was a comment from you, but I, I would like to just respond quickly on the economic support. Um, of course, it's not an altruistic move uh, from the German side. I think um, it is clear that, uh, and that has been part of the German European policy always, that G Germany can only prosper if it's a part of a strong European Union. And that's just a sign that this continues. But I do think it's important to see that it's in a, in a certain way a paradigm change on how um, Germany supports the EU distributing funds. So I think this is this is important to, to understand of the German logic behind German European policy. Um, on the export of vaccines, I think maybe I'm, I'm in the wrong bubble, but in my bubble, I think it's more uh, the, this, the frustration about the regional governments or the local governments not being able to distribute the vaccines that they have already uh, been given to the 
to the people um, and the discussion on who gets the priority where and when and that it's different in each of the lender. Um, so I think this and who gets which vaccine also, that's a big discussion also. So I think this is more prominent than the question of the exports of vaccines. And um, if you look at uh, the vaccine that is being developed in Germany, the CureVac, and it's um, less than perfect results as they are showing now in their phase three uh, testing, I think um, there's maybe a little bit more understanding that if you kind of share the burden, but also share the risks that you ultimately have a higher chance of having a good degree of vaccination. And also, I think the fact that, um, as, you, as you mentioned, it doesn't help Germany or even the EU if everyone here is vaccinated and not in other parts of the world. Um, and maybe just one thing on the, on, the, on the UK kind of strategy, if you look at the numbers in, in UK now that are not looking very, very good, I think the question is whether their strategy has actually worked. I mean, they have kept the vaccines, but they've mostly focused on the first round of vaccination and postponed the second round. And this seems to be not playing in their favor, let's say. So um, I think there's still a strong support in Germany of this kind of open and free market system that also allows for imports and exports um, in general. But I think if we look at, um, at the discussions at the um, US EU summit, which was on, on airplanes, of course, and the question on who supports the um, industries in what way and how to negotiate these, I think this is a discussion that will come back uh, later on. And also to see how do we protect kind of the European market um, if other markets are saying we, we do an America first policy in vaccinations, I think this, this will change the policy, but not maybe in the short term or in the medium to long term. And, and on the intergenerational intergener issue? Yes, sorry about that. So this is also um, a topic in Germany and it has several kind of layers because we have um, on the one hand, the discussion of course of the, of the elderly that, that that some say that they, they are now able to travel back to Mallorca, which is always a, a favorite destination for Germans and always kind of the example that is taken in all the discussions while the younger people are still waiting for the vaccine. Uh, another discussion that we also have in Germany is of course about this, the school children because um, um, when our health minister said um, that um, everyone will get an appointment for vaccination by June, July, um, he meant everyone above the age of 16. And of course, there is also a, a non, not ne uh, quite a large population that's under that age and that are still in schools where the, the, the situation is also problematic. So this discussion is very present um, in Germany. Uh, but I think what is also being seen is that the fact that the number of deaths has reduced significantly because the, the older people were vaccinated first is also being acknowledged. Okay, uh, thank you, Katrin. It's, it's interesting um, also for me as an Austrian uh, to see that in Germany, the discussion, the, there was criticism between the, the, the different lender and the federal structure, while uh, in Austria, it is more a blame game towards the European Union as if we, we were not part of, of the decision-making process sometimes, it seems. But that's, that's uh, just a footnote. Um, let me move on to, to Alice. Alice, what is the situation in Portugal? How, do, how is European solidarity perceived? Is, is everything just beautiful in terms of European solidarity? Or uh, are there higher expectations for receiving more solidarity? solidarity or how does Portugal um, give solidarity to others? Morning, everyone. Uh, no, Paul, everything is not beautiful in Portugal regarding European solidarity, but it's, it's better. It's better now. And uh, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Portuguese narrative in the last year and a half regarding European solidarity in this pandemic crisis. First, uh, I would like to say that European solidarity is not something new or recent in Portugal. After the Carnation Revolution in 1974, uh, Portugal was much supported, mostly economically and financially, uh, by um, the then European Economic Community member states. So it's not something new. But in the last year and, uh, and a half, which, uh, which have been unique years 
full of immediate uh, challenge. I think that from the Portuguese perspective, we can uh, draw uh, four uh, immediate lessons or first lessons. The first is that we consider that the COVID-19 pandemic has questioned uh, the ability of the EU institutions uh, to act immediately uh, in buying equipment, uh, both uh, for medics, the hospitals, and for personal protective equipment. Also, uh, by taking, adopting measures against uh, a deeper economic and social uh, crisis. So that is the first les lesson that the EU institutions overall are not um, fully designed uh, to tackle uh, these issues immediately. Then during the first lockdown, we had so far two in Portugal, one last year and one this year. Uh, during the first lockdown in March, April last year, uh, both the government and all opposition parties um, considered it was unanimous that the European Union should unite around solidarity. But in general, the public opinion was wondering uh, where was the EU when the Italians and the Spanish, which are uh, our, our neighboring countries, uh, were suffering. They were in need and where was the EU in helping uh, providing uh, a different path in solving their problems. Um, it was considered that the EU abandoned the Spanish and the Italians then. So the second lesson that we can draw uh, recently is that it seems that we only have a technocratic Europe full of directives, regulations, um, which is basically the, the single market. Uh, Europe was seen as the single market, free movement of people, of goods, and not a political and solidarity-driven uh, Europe, European Union. So that is the second lesson. But then, uh, while uh, the country was dealing, the country and all over the European countries were dealing with health-related issues, uh, the major concern was um, how to restart the economy. As you know, Portugal was particularly struck, mostly the tourism sector, which is which represents around 20% of our GDP. And after the first lockdown, uh, Portugal was included by several member states, such as Finland, uh, Belgium, Belgium, Hungary, uh, and also the UK, which was no longer by then a member state, was included in a blacklist of mandatory quarantine. And that had a tremendous impact um, on the tourist, tourism sector uh, as well. Uh, and that was also perceived as a lack of European solidarity towards the country. And that leads us to our third lesson which is the inability of member states to coordinate uh, on this uh, simple matter, as it was perceived, based on a common agreement or shared rules. How were the member states not able to combine between themselves, to agree between themselves, uh, the matter of mandatory quarantines? Why were some member states included on those black lists and others don't? So that was a much debated question, which has which had a real impact uh, on the country's eco economy. But then uh, last July, around last July, uh, with the approval of the next generation EU and also of the multi-annual financial uh, framework for 21-27, that uh, was much welcome in the, the country. At first, before their approval, um, the, official, the Portuguese official narratives was around. Either these funds are approved or the European Union has no reason to be. It is a failed project, it, it may disappear. But uh, that speech evolved uh, after these agreements and uh, now the official uh, speech or narrative is that this is a money bazooka or vitamin. Uh, for, at first our prime minister called it a money bazooka but then he thought it was um, a kind of military 
uh, term. So now it's a, a money vitamin, which is good for, for our health. So, uh, but either way, either you call it bazooka or money bazooka or money vitamin, the sense is there. We need money to tackle the economic and financial crisis. So the fourth lesson that we have here in Portugal is that, um, well, there isn't really a pre and post COVID different perception of the European solidarity because it remains largely dependent on the granting of European, European funding. The country is much dependent of European funding. So as, the, as long as the money keeps coming, as some say, uh, the, Portuguese the Portuguese government and the Portuguese in general have a much better perception of European integration, of European solidarity in, uh, in the end. So summing up, uh, at first, uh, the Portuguese thought, where is the EU? Then, uh, during the pandemic, there were much criticism regarding mostly the European institutions and to this particular, especially the European Commission, which is still for us the face of the European Union. Uh, and later that the European funding would solve uh, or tackle at least um, the economic and, so and social crisis. In my opinion, uh, and regarding the current situation, uh, I don't think that um, EU solidarity in this pandemic crisis among member states was necessarily motivated by being an EU member state per se. As Maya also mentioned, it is something probably more between neighboring countries. And if we were not members of the European Union, in this crisis, probably we will also help each other in the in the continent. Uh, second, uh, I also think that uh, in this, this whole process, each member state um, acted mostly uh, on their own, implementing different uh, national measures. And I don't see it so far anyone concerned in changing that or at least discussing the issue. At this point, we have member states that are um, fully opening everything. Uh, in some are still with a lot of measures. Uh, some are wearing masks, some are not going to wear masks anymore. So which one is still handling uh, nationally uh, their current situation? Possibly the major, the major breakthrough that we can possibly have uh, after or still during the pandemic um, is the build of the European Health Union, which President von der Leyen mentioned on the state of the speech last year. And for that, probably the EU for Health program will be a test um, for, for this uh, European Health Union and to prove or not whether member states are prepared and willing uh, to give a step forward uh, in, the, in the public health issues. And uh, in the end, to be more solidar uh, with, each, with each other. Thank you. Well, Alisa, uh, thank you very much indeed. I think uh, uh, your points are very, very interesting because they show that when it comes to political integrations, we still have a lot of um, a, a long way to go. Um, and when it comes to uh, financial solidarity, um, it somehow uh, seems to work. Um, I, I, I wonder if um, Portuguese EU public opinion actually only depends on the degree of financial solidarity or if there are other issues as well that come into um, their perception for solidarity. Um, apart from the money bazooka or the vitamin, the money vitamin, I would call it vitamin C injection actually, uh, C is of cash. <laughs> but um, I, I, what I just want to comment quickly from my side and taking advantage of, of being the, the, the moderator, I think uh, there's still a big difference if you're an EU member or if you're not an EU member, just ask the countries in the Western Balkan. I mean, when it comes to financial and economic 
um, solidarity when it comes to joint procurement uh, of, of vaccines. I think um, there, there was no EU competence for that and, and EU member states just had, had really problems uh, in, in, in coordinating themselves in, in, in during the crisis. And, and, and this is where it has to really has to improve. I think the crisis management is one lesson which we have to learn. Uh, that's for sure. And that is something uh, that is also discussed. Um, um, try to, um, uh, uh, to bring uh, into the set of agencies, a new agency for, for crisis management also enhance the role of the ECDC. Um, but um, there was another question I wanted to ask you. What, what uh, apart from, from asking the audience to send their questions via the chat so we can bring them in, um, what about the, the social dimension? I mean, we had the Porto Summit, the informal uh, meeting of heads of states and government and, and, and ministers and other uh, players. I mean, there were, that was quite successful, in fact. I mean, we, we, we're starting from, from not a very high level, but in terms of minimum salary discussion in terms of employment objectives. I mean, there's also something going on in, in, in terms of social integ integration, no? Well, uh, regarding your first question, if our positive perception of European integration is related only to money, no, it is not only related to money, but uh, money has its importance in the process. Uh, Portugal traditionally has been uh, quite pro-European. Uh, during the peak of the first, of the first quarantine, uh, the figures uh, dropped a little to 59%, I think. But in the meantime, they are uh, above 65, I think. So uh, the Portuguese continue to be really uh, pro-European. All our, our current government and all our past governments have all are all also uh, very pro-European. So that is not an issue in, in, in Portugal. We want to be in the European Union. We take full advantage of the benefits of the European Union, but we also contribute. Uh, you were, uh, in my introduction, you were mentioning uh, what we can also contribute with. And during this pandemic, unlike Slovenia, regarding immigrants and asylum seekers uh, and also refugees, Portugal uh, took some measures, namely it granted full citizenship rights to all, uh, to all asylum seekers in the country and to all immigrants that have requested uh, their um, residence in Portugal. And it also took, I think, around uh, more than 500 children from refugee camps uh, in Greece. Uh, just to mention uh, a few. So we also contribute on our side with, uh, with our possibilities uh, to be solidarity in the frame of, of European uh, integration. Regarding uh, the Porto Summit, Yes, uh, we made some advances. I don't think that they were uh, quite brilliant. If you say a colleague has put it brilliantly, uh, this question, he said that our Portuguese presidency is the antechamber for not Slo the Slovenia presidents in this case of the social issues, but of the French presidency. So we are uh, making steps forward, but it will all, though it will all be decided, the directive will be decided during the French uh, presidency. So, and I agree with, with that. Obviously that we know that everything in the European Union takes its time uh, to, be, uh, to be agreed. Uh, the pillar of social, um, of social rights is not also something new. It dates back from 2017, so it's an ongoing process. And obviously that since Portugal did not have a more active role, for instance, in foreign affairs, like holding the Africa, the EU Africa Summit, it focused on the social summit in Porto and it made its role and it delivered uh, some breakthroughs. Uh, Elise, uh, one, one quick comment. I mean, you cannot, you cannot conclude with everything and finalize everything. You have to leave okay. some of the work to the French. I mean, that's, that's also a, 
a, a way of showing solidarity, I think. That's important. <laughs> Thank you, Alice. Uh, let, let me move over to Risto. Risto, what's the situation from a, uh, from a Bulgarian point of view? I mean, the... the uh, I don't, I don't want to get into nation, national politics, but the situation is not that easy. But still, um, I wonder how uh, European solidarity is seen. Is it a one-way street? What is the contribution from the Bulgarian side, Risto? Your Thank floor. You yeah, Thank you. Um, I will continue in the line of few of the arguments we already heard. Um, and I will start by answering the questions uh, that were raised in the in the chat about solidarity with someone else or intergenerational solidarity. Um, I will say quite openly that solidarity is not um, high on the agenda in Bulgarian society in general, uh, to say the least. I mean, the immediate uh, circles of trust in Bulgaria is the uh, closest family members. Uh, when you start talking uh, um, outside of that box, you know, your neighbors, your close relatives, uh, people, generally 60% of Bulgarian things think that you should not be trusting anyone outside of your family circle. Uh, and that's a very low point on, uh, you know, um, if you don't have trust in the others, obviously um, there is no, no question about solidarity whatsoever. Um, and um, based on that also, uh, and a few of the events that we saw in terms of crisis on European level, the COVID-19, but before that, the financial crisis. Um, the Bulgarian attitudes towards those issues, the migration crisis as well, were strictly instrumental. In the case of Greece, that's because we are on the Balkans, obviously, uh, the Bulgarian reaction was, uh, you know, wanting or being happy about Greeks being punished for what they've done in previous years, rather than commenting and discussing common mechanisms through which you can aid or it, um, possibly avoid uh, future scenarios like the Greek one in the financial crisis. This was also the case with regards to migration, um, migration as well. Um, we have seen a slight change when it, come to, uh, when it came to COVID-19. Uh, with a bit of solidarity sneaking in. But before I uh, tell you what that is, I'll try and answer why that's the case, uh, perhaps. Uh, two major reasons, I think, um, that will give us a point for a future debate as well. One is the way that Bulgaria joined the European uh, Union. Actually, there was a universal um, consensus in Bulgarian society, especially after the outcome of the banking and financial crisis in uh, 1997, uh, there was no prominent actor in Bulgaria that was against joining the EU. Uh, and as a result, there was no need for a debate on any level uh, about European values, about actual reasons why Bulgaria is joining the European Union, about the possible you know, uh, generational attitudinal change that Bulgarian society will undertake. It was a uh, very simple answer, joining the European market and getting the European money. Uh, so everything became closed in a very technical uh, accession process um, about changes, about legislational amendments, about closing um, you know, the nuclear power plants. This was the level of debate that was going on in Bulgarian society. As a result, basically, still we don't have an answer to the question other than the money, why Bulgaria is um, a member of the European Union and what does that tell us in terms of a membership club, you know. Um, and I think that uh, has to tell us a lot about European solidarity. Um, if anything, the crisis from recent years has shown us, I think, and that's arguable, of course, uh, that um, solidarity is not simply a matter of opportunity, whether you, you are rich or poor, whether you can show solidarity or not. It's also a matter of uh, values. I mean, why are you showing this sort of solidarity, even you know, at your own expense, that is the case. Um, and the crisis have pretty much universally domesticated the narrative, uh, especially with COVID-19. Uh, all of the responses on European level has been targeted at addressing national political issues and questions. And uh, solidarity became caught in, uh, in this sort of um, domestic political discourse and, um, and conflicts 
to say the to say the least. Um, and in Bulgaria, that was um, especially visible in the uh, in the last couple of crises, especially the migrants, and now in COVID nineteen. Um, secondly, Bulgaria is an interesting um, paradox. From the very beginning, based on that consensus, Bulgarians have always been EU optimist. Uh, well above 60, even 70% of Bulgarians uh, do believe that um, you know, joining the European Union was a good thing. And around 50% at this point, 54 or something, believe that future integration of the EU is a good thing. So we actually want more of the EU. Uh, on that side of the equation, Bulgarians are trusting European institutions much more than Bulgarian institutions. That was especially visible in the last uh, year of protests going on in Bulgaria against the um, corrupt government or the allegations of corruption in the government, the desire to change uh, the, the rule in Bulgaria. We were always hoping that Europeans will do something about it uh, and will get rid us of this corrupt government. On the same, at the same time, however, the paradox is that Bulgarians show much more solidarity and expect much more solidarity from the um, from Bulgarian institutions. So based on culture, identity, you know, religion, all these general topics, uh, we were expecting Bulgarian institutions and we are more solidar with them rather than with the Europeans. Around 30% of Bulgarians, um, almost close to 40 actually, don't care at all what is happening to Europeans. Um, what are their living conditions? What are their problems? And whether we can address these. And around 50% don't think that the uh, Bulgarians' voice is heard enough in Europe. And the result, as a result, there is a very um, straightforward situation in Bulgaria. Um, the only thing that the narrative, the official discourse, the political discourse allows for in terms of discussion is the discussion on European money. Um, something that Maya started with. Uh, the question is when do we receive solidarity and not whether we should or for what reasons we should be part of European solidarity uh, in general. And that has had a significant impact on how Bulgarians think on uh, about European Union and about neighborhood neighborhood countries, um, especially in the in the light of the uh, restoration package currently. You know the um, the uh, idea that some money should be coming down to Bulgaria. Um, pretty much happened the way that it was already discussed. It was behind closed doors. The plan was uh, published for discussion, but with very short time for discussion. And actually, it was condemned as being um, completely outside of the actual problems that Bulgaria is facing. Uh, and this sort of domesticating the agenda nationally uh, on such big topics like you know common responses to uh, common crises, I think is um, the biggest issue that we need to face. Uh, obviously, when domesticating the agenda, we cannot expect national governments, with few exceptions, uh, Germany being one of these exceptions, I think, uh, to, to, to try and change attitudes. What we've seen, especially in Bulgaria, is politicians and government working with those attitudes, you know, telling the narrative the way that people want to, to hear it. It was not a common European effort that we've developed this huge package for post-COVID restoration. It was the um, Boyko Borisov's personal contribution to taking these 13 billions out of Europe. Um, so it's something that is, you know, it, it would never happen if it wasn't for Boyko Borisov. And most of the Bulgarian, um, you know, public opinion goes with it, um, got, goes with that sort of a narrative, um, exactly because, you know, deeper down, we don't have this shared sense of belonging um, to a community of some sort. Uh, we are feeling like we are be belonging to a club who has to give us something. Um, the conversation about contributing to the European Union is totally outside of the question uh, on any level for that, uh, for that matter. 
And I think that what needs to be changed in that direction, um, we've always talked about, you know, European institutions being uh, bureaucracies and, you know, having, um, not having to be political. I think that on a range of issues, uh, especially in recent years, we should start changing those institutions the other way around. They should be becoming more political. Um, given the fact that Bulgarians are trusting European institutions, there is huge potential for a narrative coming directly from them, working towards a changing in that, you know, um, in that direction, uh, in presenting an, an alternative view about European Union in terms of values, uh, in terms of shared responsibility, in terms of better responses to common crises, um, because this will not come from national governments, no matter how you know, uh, elaborate that is, or how benevolent these governments are. Uh, so we need to have a, an addressed approach uh, to, uh, towards different national politics with different messages going the same direction. One, you know, um, one narrative fit all in terms of 26 members of the EU, uh, I think will uh, will continue to fail um, from here on. Uh, and that is um, something that I, I think should be the direction of, um, of change if we want to see actually more solidarity or um, actually more, uh, you know, governments trying to, to get more on board with um, with showing this sort of solidarity. Um, the COVID-19, uh, a funny story and I end up. Um, this was the one case in which Bulgaria actually contributed to solidarity. Boyko Borisov um, refurbished some uh, Bulgarian enterprises to, towards producing COVID protection um, gear uh, of sorts. And they, uh, he promised this to Austria Paul and to, to Germany. Actually, um, a contract was signed and Germany ordered a lot of some of this pro protectional clothing for the uh, German military. The recent scandal around that is very, um, very showing towards uh, this instrumental approach to, to solidarity. Um, the quality of the gear uh, was questionable to say the least. The need for that gear was questionable to say the least. So it was only an instrument through which specific businesses in Bulgaria were, dot, um, were receiving again money from the European Union rather than you know, being active into driving this process of um, common solution to a common problem. And um, this will continue to be the case if um, something doesn't change generally, I think. Thank you um, all. Uh, Risto, thank you, thank you very much. I mean, we, we all have uh, similar experiences uh, concerning uh, medical uh, uh, production of, of, of medical uh, uh, protection devices. Uh, I remember there was a company in Austria who promised that they would produce masks made in Austria and they finally ordered them in China. And I think uh, in Germany, we also had, uh, there were, were also some, some similar similar issues there where uh, the quality of the mask was not controlled due to the high demand and the speed of the crisis. Um, very interesting, Risto. Uh, there was a question from the chat uh, regarding the conditionality of, of financial support uh, because trust is so high in EU institutions, uh, which you have underlined. Do we need a stricter condition? Would a stricter conditionality, would the conditionality mechanism, for example, uh, on the on the rule of law, is that accepted? Is that widely accepted, or, or what is the situation? Well, we uh, we have had the monitoring mechanism um, for quite some time now, um, and each report has been very critical with regards to the judicial system in Bulgaria. And it had, it had an impact in society, but it had no impact on the outcome um, at, at the end. I mean, it's generally used for, on, on behalf of the opposition. I don't think that conditionality uh, will contribute in that direction. I think that more proactive approach, um, directly, uh, a direct engagement of EU institutions with the society might have a better impact 
rather than you know the uh, representation of European Commission in Bulgaria is simply that um, a representation, a retranslator, let's say, of um, the official statement or a retranslator of money. Uh, or simply um, a, a post that is sending information towards the Brussels institutions. I think that it should become a player. That's what I'm saying. It should be really active into engaging social groups, into engaging Bulgarian society in general, into trying to work with them uh, and with changing the, these attitudes. Uh, this attitudinal change is the, uh, the, the end goal, I think. Um, making the process clearer in general, because now everything happens, uh, it's very technical and it happens outside the public attention. What is presented to the society, not only in Bulgaria, I think you would agree, is only the, the end result. So we see the, the deal that has been reached uh, among the member states. We don't understand why the positions of national government have been such, uh, who has won, who has lost. You know, These are not uh, things that generally become public. And these are exactly the things that have been used to stir public attention, no, no, no less. Um, and governments have been taking use about, you know, the possible conspiracy theories because in behind each decision. So the process needs to be made more public, needs to be um, actively communicated. Uh, the reasons why the decision is such needs to be actively communicated, not from passing through national governments, but directly. Uh, and I think that's the only way forward uh, if we want something to change in that direction. Uh, Risto, I have so, ma so many questions for you. I wonder where to start. Uh, there was one in the chat now on the quality of, of democracy. Has quality of democracy improved with EU membership or is it more like Ivan Kraschev puts it, that 30% of, 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 of the people have left and, and, and that's the way politics is done now uh, in, in Bulgaria? How do you see it? Um, well, the, the living standards have improved, um, which created, you know, a, a strong enough class in Bulgaria that has been already uh, educated in uh, democratic attitudes. Um, the problem with Bulgarian uh, democracy is that it's largely still uh, formal and proced um, procedural, let's say. The actual problem with Bulgarian democracy comes from the parties themselves. They don't function the way they should. Uh, which creates disengagement uh, on behalf of Bulgarian society towards politics. So the actual problem uh, with democracy is not institutional that much. Um, it's um, attitudinal. It's how we can get people back on board with democracy, actively engaged into democracy uh, rather than uh, the other way around. Um, so we have had corruption scandals. We have had failing institutions. But the one thing that still works, um, I think, is the democratic institution itself. The elections are free and fair, and they're producing results. We are not happy with the results, you know, and that's, uh, that's the problem with it. OK. Now, um, thank you, Risto. We, we're going right into, this, into the discussion, because there are already, already uh, some questions and comments in the chats. And I would just uh, distribute them to you. Um, Alice, there was one question for you. I'm sure you saw it. Uh, the, the question on, uh, in, in, the end of your, in, in the end of your statement, you said that Portugal was very active and showed solidarity by giving citizenships, uh, by um, bringing in uh, 500 uh, refugees. Um, and the question more or less in the chat was, um, is this not counterproductive uh, to a overall European coordinated approach? Well, you may consider to be uh, counterproductive if, we cons if there was really at the time uh, a joint uh, response to the pandemic crisis. I don't think there was. Uh, so each, as I, as I mentioned, each country manage uh, the pandemic response on their own, uh, adopting their national measures. And the both, mo both measures that I mentioned, the granting of citizenship rights uh, to asylum seekers and immigrant, immigrants, illegal immigrants in the country, and also by welcoming um, um, 
children from the refugee camps in Greece were uh, totally national measures in the peak of the crisis. Uh, our, uh, our president even said several times on national TV, on newspapers and so forth, that we were on war against the virus. So initially the discourse in Portugal is we are on war against the virus. So we have to adopt a series of unprecedented measures to tackle it. And these were some that were taken at the social level in order to improve, uh, to improve the lives of these people. Because if you are in Portugal and you are an illegal immigrant, you will be vaccinated. You can go to, uh, to the centers that are vaccinating and you will get your vaccine. It doesn't matter if you are a Portuguese citizen, if you are living legally in the country or illegally, you will get vaccinated. So that was a much welcome social measure that all Portuguese agreed. And I don't think that in the end, it will be counterproductive regarding the whole European Union, it was a, just a side measure on a specific moment to tackle a very specific uh, subject. Thank no, you. and I think there's also there's think there's also a coalition of the willing. You no, know? there, there there are other member states too that that mm -hmm. try to uh, to to bring in uh, young uh, young refugees that are on the Greek islands uh, without. Uh, without a, a, a perspective. I wonder, uh, Kathleen, what's the situation in Germany? Germany is also part of this coalition of, of, of the willing. Uh, is there, uh, how, is there a, a defined number of, uh, of, of young people that are, that are being brought in from, from the Greek islands? So or what's the situation there? Um, actually, um, and, um, maybe just to give a, a little bit more of a general background, because actually we had a discussion on this topic just yesterday with the um, Ministry for, of the Interior and on the question of how the migration issue can be uh, can be solved. And the position at the time or yesterday was that um, they were saying that with the measures that Germany took in 2015, um, this was um, that we overburdened or, or put too much pressure on the other EU member states. And my initial reaction was to say that it's not exactly Germany that put the pressure on, but it was the uh, war situation in the countries where the people were fleeing from. So we have to, I mean, I understand, of course, it's true that there was also political pressure, but the, the initial pressure was, of course, because of the deteriorating situation in those countries. And I think what, uh, what we are facing with the migration issue is it's a true Gordian knot because the, the structures, the political structures that we have in the EU always work in such a way that you build pressure by an inaction in order to achieve a decision uh, with all member states. But in the, in the case of the migration policy, whenever you try to build up this pressure, who suffers are the, the migrants and are the people, and there are people dying when you do so. So there's no real, the, the structures and mechanisms that the EU has for coming up with a solution on tough decisions just doesn't work in this case because you always break international law when doing so. Um, and um, in Germany, we have a situation that we have, um, um, that we have decisions so there's a general decision that, uh, that uh, people are being brought to Germany from, from Moria. Um, but again, it's, it's based on the lender level. So it's lender decisions um, that uh, decide on the numbers. Um, and the, I think the numbers that were accepted are higher than the numbers that have actually come to Germany because of organizational issues or acceptance issues. But I'm not, not sure of the current status at the moment. And I wanted to say one other thing because I didn't mention this in my presentation and I was um, dealing with the um, recovery and resilience package because all of you mentioned the national discussions on this issue. And I was thinking, did I miss something there? Because I can't remember any national discussion on this. Um, so I checked Google and all the, all the kind of results that I get to tell me everything about Austria and nothing about Germany. So I think there was really not that much of a discussion. I mean, Germany doesn't want to take any uh, any credits on so so I think it was much more I mean it was on the professional level the com, com, like the, the 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 cities and communities they gave input and there was also an organized discussion around with different kind of interest stakeholders but it was not such a publicized discussion in like the tabloid media that were kind of exploiting the situation or any kind of drastic 
kind of terms that were being voiced. It was more a technical discussion, let's say. I just wanted to add this uh, to kind of round up the picture on this topic as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, it was interesting. I mean, that was also so because maybe it, it was during the uh, German council presidency, um, but um, uh, the degree of transparency in Germany regarding the, uh, the, the national um, recovery plan was higher than in many other countries because you, at least the draft was published, it was discussed, and then the European Commission was not really satisfied with it. And, and then there was a little bit of a discussion at least, um, uh, which, which was, I think, in important huh? um, yeah, it was Maya, just so polarized uh, that, i think that's what i want that's to true say, you know? that's true that's that's that, the, yeah sorry that's true um maya there was a question for you from sabina uh, i i right at the beginning of our discussion i think the question of the role um also in in the context of solidarity the question of the role of slovenia in the region of the Western Balkans, what about solidarity between Slovenia and the other Western Balkan countries? How do you see uh, Slovenia's role uh, also with regards to uh, enlargement negotiations, support? Is this going to play a, a, an important role in the upcoming presidency? Uh, will we see some progress there? Well, the question whether we will see progress or not is an <laughs> open one, but definitely it is being put on uh, the agenda for the Slovenian presidency. There is a strong belief that we should have a much clearer um, strategy as what to do with the Western Balkan countries and how, how to integrate them and or at least show them what are their perspectives in uh, not so far future in terms of what kind of conditions should be put there. But if we talk about Slovenian solidarity with the region, with the broader region, uh, I think are the two things that I would like to, to point out. On one hand, Slovenia did uh, grant not a huge amount, but at least some amount of vaccines to Bosnia where the problems were really harsh. But on the other hand, you know, we do have a lot of people working in Slovenia who come from Western Balkan countries, particularly from Bosnia, but also other regions. And during our lockdowns, we had a very harsh policy uh, introduced in terms of allowing them to visit their families back home. It was practically the border was closed. And if these people wanted to go and see their families, the conditionality imposed was really harsh in terms of practically compulsory quarantine after they returned, et cetera, et cetera, which made for them uh, impossible uh, to go and then see, uh, see their families for more than half a year or so. And here, I think one of the things which goes beyond what just Slovenia and I was thinking of when I was listening to everybody else, and I think it was also the comment that um, was made in the chat. What is interesting to observe in the issue of solidarity is how often we as European member countries don't like the commission to get involved in certain policies because we think that this is our national sovereignty and we should be allowed to do whatever we see fit for our own country. But when the crisis happens, then it's the commission or the EU blamed for not reacting yeah so that someone has to be well, blamed Maya somebody's got to be blamed and it's not going to be mine uh, because I will be facing next elections and maybe it's not too good to say that my government was not prepared to react pro promptly on the crisis yeah uh, so the commission is a, is, a, is a nice scapegoat for everything which which goes wrong and uh, when they do try to make some regulation, then again, they are infringing on our national sovereignty. And here you see this double-faced member's uh, attitude towards what do we expect from the EU? And then you see how powerless it is when it tries to do something. And just follow the debate now about opening up the borders. I mean, if you look at the national regulations and who can come, every country has a different attitude towards it. I was just yesterday, my, my family is planning a trip to Italy, surprised that for the Italians, vaccination doesn't count. You have to have a test. 
Then you go to Austria, there's another set of rules. When you go to Croatia, it's another set of rules. Even in details, like, you know, how many days have to pass from being vaccinated and which vaccine does count and which one doesn't. And in all the efforts that we are trying to put together, you know, sort of having a common agenda to fight something, we still have not reached even the basic principles of what we want to do together or not. So that's, I think, a, a, a big drawback on solidarity. That's very true. <laughs> that's, that's very true. Um, Risto, um, two more questions for you, Tamei. How is, um, you all remember that we had this issue uh, with AstraZeneca with, with a lack of, of delivery of vaccines. And then um, there was a decision on this, a correction mechanism on this to help out those countries that uh, focused in their order more on AstraZeneca. How was this correction mechanism perceived? Was this perceived positively? That is one question. And the second easy question uh, for the end of our discussion, uh, when will, we, so when will uh, we be able to solve the Macedonia language issue with Bulgaria? Actually, it's not about the language, which makes it a bit more complicated. Uh, if it was about the language, it's easy. It's ours, then that's done. <laughs> the history, uh, the history. Yeah. Well, uh, starting with the correction mechanism, um, no one understood about it. Actually, it was uh, Bulgaria was the first country um, which uh, banned all vaccinations with AstraZeneca the moment that the issue became public. So it's amidst the protests, you know, this government was going out already. Uh, so the, uh, the Boko Borisov didn't hesitate at all. We heard about the problem, vaccination was stopped. And at that time, there wasn't a lot of people that wanted vaccines. So basically, everything flied under the radar. Uh, afterwards, um, they were reopened and no one really cared what they were vaccinated with anymore. So, you know, this was, um, this wasn't even an issue in Bulgarian context. We had other problems with vaccinations, you know, the organization of the process, the lack of vaccines, they became so prominent that everything else was um, simply not in interesting enough. Um, concerning the, uh, not Macedonia, um, this is an artificial problem currently, uh, to say the least. And it, is also, it was also a product of uh, the upcoming elections in the, in the spring, uh, because the small partner of the government was um, strongly related with that issue. Under their influence, the uh, government decided to stop this, the Bulgarian support for continuing negotiations. Uh, and the problem is history. Um, we have an we have a conflict of uh, whose history it is. It is, is it Bulgarian? Is it um, a North Macedonian? Uh, and the very, from the very beginning, linking the problem of, you know, accepting Macedonia to the European Union to solving the problem with history was a mistake, huge mistake. This is not an issue that we could solve, um, at least not in foreseeable future. So if that continues to be the case, um, uh, Macedonia will probably not become a member of the European Union soon. I really hope that um, this uh, will stop being the problem. So we will start talking about the benefits of Macedonia in regional security, you know, in regional uh, partnership, all these issues uh, to become more important than uh, solving the problem with history. Um, it requires a much better um, informed government, one which I don't know whether we will be able to produce, however. Well, uh, thank you very much. I know I think um, what we have seen from the discussion is the, the high number of different elements uh, that we can, of different topics that we can actually discuss when we talk about solidarity. And I think that makes it so interesting that, that uh, this whole solidarity discussion uh, depends, it, it, the definition of solidarity depends very much on where you sit and how you see it, through which lenses do you actually look at it. 
and it shows uh, the diversity of the topic and the diversity of Europe. And I think that's why the upcoming book is actually so interesting. It's a little bit of a, um, as we say, it is a a guide, a political guide through uh, through Europe, and and that's that's exciting. That's an exciting discussion, which we will not be able to conclude. Uh, I think here because. Uh, it will be it will be continued, um, but I thank you very much. I, th I thank very much for everyone who who contributed uh, in the chats and uh, who listened to us. And a special thanks, of course, goes out to Maya, to Katrin, to Alice, and to Risto for for their uh, contributions and their input to the discussion. Um, this is going to be continued in terms of the conference. I think Maya, if I'm not mistaken, and I have the program here. Uh, the sessions will continue at 3.30. Correct. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Yes. Well, uh, we are right on time. Thank you all very much for joining. Um, I hope to see you all very soon. And uh, it is always very interesting to hear about the different perspectives on, on European affairs. And I hope to see you all very soon in person. I think I can say that for everyone. Uh, the sooner the better and um, stay safe have a nice summer thank you very much bye